Is your dog smart? Stay tuned ahead. I'll talk with Jennifer Holland about Dog Smart, life-changing lessons in canine intelligence. We'll discuss new research that shows dogs are much more intelligent than most people think. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Jennifer S. Holland is a longtime writer for National Geographic who's contributed to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NPR. She joins us to talk about Dog Smart. Jennifer, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Well, let's start with something basic. We know that dogs can do a lot of things, and they know a lot of things that humans even don't. But what's the difference between instinct and intelligence? You know, I think we, we've we long sort of thought, or many people have thought of animals as being straight up instinct. So instinct being kind of that automatic response to things that, that lets animals, you know, flee if there's a, a danger, that sort of thing that, that lets them thrive in the wild. But really intelligence is something mushier than that. It's something bigger than that. It's something that, that can be grown and fed and I think it, it's something we see in dogs. And if we give them opportunities, we can really see it manifest in so many different ways. So how can you test a dog's intelligence? Well, these days they're doing some remarkable things. They've trained dogs to lie in an MRI, magnetic resonance imager. And uh, if anyone has ever experienced that, you know that that's not an easy experience. You really have to lie very, very still. And uh, But they can expose dogs to, to different activities and different things and see right in the brain where there is uh, electrical activity. So what's lighting up? Is it emotional response? Is it a, a stress response? What do we see happening in the brain? And to compare that to what happens in a human brain in the same context, it can be really instructive. Um, there's a lot of behavioral studies. There's a lot of, of behavioral organizations out there that are doing wonderful studies. So it's really the field has blossomed in, in the last couple of decades, I would say. One of the things you write about in the book is that we think of a dog's intelligence in terms of their ability to do what we tell them to, their ability to, you know, recognize voice commands. But you also say a sign of intelligence is when they don't do <laughs> what you tell them to do. Yes, interesting, interesting way to think about it. Uh, that's in, in particular, there's, there's something called intelligent disobedience. Um, it's mostly uh, at play in, in working dogs, something like a seeing eye dog, where the animal has to know that even if they're being told to do something and, and it's something that they know how to do and they normally would respond positively to, if, if it's a dangerous situation, they need to know to not do it. So for example, if there's a branch hanging down and they're walking with a visually impaired person and the person is giving them the command to move forward, the dog has to know that branch could hit my person in the head and I need to, to not do that. Or, you know, the car is coming, I can hear it. Even if the person doesn't, I'm not going to cross the street, even though I'm being told that I should. And, and to me, that was such a remarkable thing to think about because they're, you know, they're doing two different things. It's they've learned what to do when we tell them to, but they also know when to choose not to do it. And uh, what a, that's just, that's amazing to me. Well, I want to talk about some specific pieces of information you share in the book, but give us an idea of the research that you had to do to put this book together. Yeah, uh, I was really fortunate because it was, uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic when I started working on it. So, of course, I started with a lot of interviews of, of different experts out there in the world. Uh, but my hope was to do field work because that's what I really do best and what I enjoy. And people were remarkably generous about making that happen. And so I spent time with the Seeing Eye trainers. I spent time at Lackland Air Force Base uh, with the military dog trainers. I went out with folks who train their dogs for cadaver sniffing, for search and rescue. Uh, I was on a sheep farm with a shepherdess and a hunting grounds with, uh, with, uh, during hunting dog trials. Um, the, the cadaver work was some of the most interesting just to see dogs that can sniff out bones that are hundreds of years old. And, and just the, the fact that dogs can smell just about anything is, uh, is a really amazing thing. Um, but I was really spent time all over the country um, and, and was just with some wonderful, remarkable people and some incredible dogs. So very fortunate. One of the things that always amazed me is that there are some dogs can be trained to sense when there's going to be a medical emergency yes. uh, with their person. And um, that, 
that just kind of boggles my mind. Yeah, yeah. And and in some cases, they don't really know exactly what the dog is responding to. Um, something like a diabetic, you know, there is a, a scent component with a, a high blood sugar or a low blood sugar event, a dog can be trained to sense that. But something like a person with with epilepsy, um, you know, who a dog may be able to sense when a seizure is coming quite a bit before it happens. And, and so there may be different cues that the dog's responding to. It may be scent. It may also be behavioral things that we wouldn't notice and that our tools might not even pick up, but the dog can smell or can sense in some way that, that this is happening and will just can be trained to have a really powerful and, and useful response to help that person. Incredible stuff. Well, as you were doing your research, what were some of the things that surprised you the most that you really didn't expect to see? Um, I would say, you know, in part, just the the love that these working dogs have for their work. I guess I don't know if, if it was not it was not terribly surprising, but to actually see it in action was was such a wonderful thing. Because sometimes you hear people, oh, it, it's such a shame that dog has to lie there with the person, and you know, it makes you feel bad that the working dogs have to have these jobs. But I got the sense that these dogs just love what they do and they're always ready to work. And if you put the the harness or the the jacket on or whatever it is, the dogs would get so excited to get out and do the thing that they're trained to do. And and just that that love they have of of doing, you know, actually succeeding, making us happy, makes them happy. There's kind of this this joyous back and forth that was really incredible to see and just made me want to get out with more and, and see more of the same. I'm talking with Jennifer Holland about Dog Smart, life-changing lessons in canine intelligence. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll know when I post new interviews. And thank you. Tell us a bit more about some of the, the exceptional dogs you had a chance to experience and what they were able to do. Yeah. Um, some of them include dogs that are trained for uh, conservation work. So there are dogs, for, uh, an organization, Conservation Canines and, and others out on the West Coast of the U.S. that are trained to go out into, um, you know, very, you know, wild areas and they can track down the, the scat, the poop of, you know, a particular species or a particular type of animal. They can be very general. They can be very specific and can help you know, when scientists maybe want to assess how a population is doing in a particular area, for example, uh, or an exotic species, if there's a plant that they need to get rid of. Um, they're even doing that on, on some vineyards now. They're able to use the dogs to help track down you know, exotic invasive species and fungus and that kind of thing um, to help them to handle those kinds of situations. Uh, I was on a boat with a dog that sniffs for whale scat, on the surface of the ocean. So the, the poop is floating uh, on the ocean for a short time and the dog can, can help guide the boat to where they need to go to get a sample um, so that they can assess the, the health of the whales in this, in this area. Uh, cadaver dogs, again, the, the search and rescue, watching a dog follow its nose through a path that somebody has taken and, and find their way to that person in a, a very wooded, you know, tangled sort of area amazing stuff to watch and uh, and these disease sniffing dogs to see them in training and to know that they can pick up on these these scents that we just didn't even know were there was remarkable based on what you learned in your research is there an indication that there's a difference between breeds or some breeds smarter than others I think it's it varies there's you know there's no sort of one dog uh, or one kind of dog in a breed. The genetics is very powerful. So selective breeding, you can uh, have a breed that has a tendency to be a certain kind of intelligent. But um, but I've seen studies and, and examples of dogs that you would never expect to succeed in certain kinds of tasks. But when given the opportunity and the right kind of training, they they do just as well. So I think it's it's just not quite as cut and dried as, you know, border collies are the smartest dogs. They're very, very intelligent in certain ways, but other kinds of dogs might be intelligent in different ways. And it's just a matter of kind of broadening your idea of intelligence, I think. 
So it sounds like it's like humans. It's it's nurture and nature that, that play into their experience and, and what they've been able to learn, how they've been trained, which raises a couple of questions for me. One is, is there anything that a person who has a pet in their life, a dog in their life, can do to help foster their growth and to become more intelligent animals? I think it's it's a matter of, of opportunity. Um, not everybody has the, the ability and the means and the time to do all the things that, you know, they might want to do with their dogs. But I do feel if you, if you have a dog and the dog has, you know, curiosity and enjoys sniffing, you know, giving them the opportunity to do that, even just a longer walk where you don't tug on the leash constantly saying, let's go, let's go. Just let them kind of do their thing. Cause they're really, that's how they experience the world. It, it really gives them, um, the time to just be a dog. And, and to do natural dog things, to use their their natural dog tools. Um, exposing them to a lot of stuff as very young puppies, if you have that chance, is very important. Um, and the right kind of training, I think the positive reinforcement, uh, that has changed a bit. There was a time when all the trainers were talking about being, you need to be the alpha, and it's about overpowering the dog. And that has really changed. And now it's really about positive incentives. And, and that seems to be a much better way to train a dog for the long term. They're going to hold on to what they learn much, much better if they learn it in a positive way. One of the takeaways for me from this book is that dogs are more intelligent than we give them credit for. And acknowledging the fact that these are more intelligent creatures than we thought, what is the implication then for we as humans and how we should interact with them? Yeah. I, again, I think it's about thinking through a little bit more, or just being a little more thoughtful about how we interact with them. Um, you know, we we sort of tend to to expect them to fit into our world, and they do. That's part of their intelligence is their ability to adapt to our world. But but we take something away from them in doing that, and and so I feel the more I've kind of come to see the intelligence, the different kinds of intelligence in my dogs the more I'm, I'm trying to give them something back and to let them to express those kinds of intelligence in, in their own way and not be so quick to try to get them to fit into my, my way of thinking. Now, there's so much more in this book that we haven't had the opportunity to talk about. So for those who have interest have been piqued, give us a brief overview of the book. What are readers going to find here? It's, it's a mix of, um, of you know, kind of the, the experts' opinions and science. There's a lot of science in it. Um, also, plenty of field work, so lots of on-the-ground experiences. There's a lot of wonderful personal stories from people who have had amazing experiences with their dog's intelligence, and some personal stuff as well. My own dogs are in there. Uh, some learning that I did, learning and growing that I did throughout my reporting is part of it. And it, it's just, um, it's kind of a, a combination of, of all kinds of thinking about how dogs think and, and what that means for us and how we relate to them. So in summary, what would you say are the, the key points or the new appreciation that you hope readers will take from the book about dogs? I think that, that intelligence is more than one thing. And, and seeing that and appreciating dogs for what they have naturally, not just for how they are with us. Um, and appreciating that, that olfactory intelligence, that social intelligence, the remarkable way that they communicate with one another, giving, you know, trying to learn their language better um, is, is a really key point and, and really understanding a little bit more about what they're trying to say uh, rather than just making commands and demands of them. Um, I think is, is a big part of what I wanted to get across. Well, to learn more, the book is Dog Smart, Life-Changing Lessons in Canine Intelligence by Jennifer S. Holland. Jennifer, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Now, if you'd like to purchase Dog Smart, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.